Life Audio. Hello, my name is Shara Donahue, and thanks for joining me today for the Bible Out of Context. I hope this episode will help you find the secret of contentment as we explore the verse, Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. The world is always on, but you shouldn't be. Put junk sleep to bed. During Mattress Firm's sleeping spree event, save up to 50% on ceiling. With queen mattresses starting at $349.99. Only at Mattress Firm. Restrictions apply. See store or mattressfirm.com for details. Hello, hello. Quinice Petway here, co-host of the Your Daily Bible Verse podcast. Are you someone who loves to take a deep dive into God's word one verse at a time to explore his will for your life and desire to draw closer to him? If that sounds like you, I'd love to invite you to head over to lifeaudio.com and search your daily Bible verse to tune in and subscribe for daily inspiration, life application, and spiritual transformation through the in-depth exploration of God's Word. This verse is so often used to find courage to face hard circumstances, but we need to make sure we know what it is that God is promising to strengthen us for. It is not that I can fly through Christ because he gives me strength or claim this verse over a lottery ticket and expect to win. The promise is that through Christ, I can find the strength to be content in any and all circumstances. So that even if I can't fly or I never have a lot of money, I do through Christ have the power to be content. Let's look at the verse in context, starting at verse 11 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him. We're talking about Christ here. Through him who strengthens me. God can do miraculous things. He is mighty. He can do things beyond our imagination. But this verse is clearly talking about the strength to be content in all circumstances. As Joel Ryan says, Paul looked to the spiritual provision of Jesus Christ to find strength, hope, joy, peace, and contentment in even his darkest situation. It is this power that transforms hearts and frees minds oppressed by the discouragement of present circumstances. And in a time when his own circumstances were limited, Paul turned to Christ for the strength to be content and still have joy. The same power that could deliver him from prison in an instant was the power that was daily transforming Paul's own heart to become more like Christ's own. Oh, a plague of discontentment is weakening too many souls, and we must make it stop. God's word gives us the secret to the contentment we are all seeking. Paul wrote to the Philippians while on house arrest with the truth that we can rejoice, be thankful, and think rightly in all circumstances. Our culture is always whispering to us, do more, have more, be more. But what would it look like to live securely knowing God will provide all you need? How would your life change if you lived out of a content heart, opposed to a striving one? Paul knew struggle, and his words reveal that knowing Christ brings assurance. All that must be done will be done. Contentment may seem elusive, but we see in this passage it is possible. It can be had. 
in any and all situation. It meets us when all our hustle finds its rest in the hands of Christ. So, now that we know the promise, let's tackle a couple of things that lead to discontentment. It seems to me that one of the first issues we should discuss is how thinking we know better than God leads us to discontentment. If we really understood the greatness of the story that God is telling, we would recognize that our lives are both a small and mighty thing. Small in the sense that we are but one character in the story God is telling. Mighty in that if we live knowing this life is all about God, we get the privilege of helping to build an eternal kingdom. A kingdom that will outlast evil, outlast pain, and outlast sin. This is why there is so much pride wrapped in the moments we think we could know better or do better than God, and such folly in living for ourselves alone, when all we do in life is serve me and mine. I serve myself as the God of my own kingdom and make the mistake of believing God serves me. God loves us. He cares for us. He provides for us. And Jesus came as the servant king. In moments of clarity, can we actually conceive of telling God, I see your way, but mine is better? We would like to say no, but the truth is, we often do this. We do it at work, in relationships, and even when it comes to how we approach spiritual things. This wreaks havoc on our ability to be content and strengthened by God because we are simply choosing to ignore Him. This ignoring can also come in the form of delayed obedience. How often do we know that God is asking us to do something and yet we still delay our obedience? Maybe we wouldn't be so brazen as to just tell Him no, but we routinely tell God later. We convince ourselves that too many other things need our immediate attention. And surely God would understand why we tabled his command to speak to that neighbor, help that friend, or serve in a certain ministry at church. It is wise to not overwhelm ourselves with activity. But too often that wisdom is used as an excuse for not doing what God has said. This is often because obedience to do something new means stopping something we don't really feel ready to stop. We are downplaying God and cheating ourselves out of contentment. Now, fear of man likes to slip in there as well. It's another common thief of contentment, mostly because we have stopped looking for Christ to strengthen us and are instead seeking the approval of others. I understand the desire for community. Everyone wants a sense of belonging, and many are desperately searching for it. That desire, if left unchecked, leads people into alternating cycles of fear of man and people-pleasing. When our loves are rightly oriented, that puts and keeps Jesus as first. We find more contentment when we live with a reverential fear of God and seek to please Him before all others. We live like Paul who in Galatians 1.10 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Envy and jealousy are often confused, but both play a part in attacking contentment. Richard H. Smith reported in Psychology Today that envy occurs when we lack a desired attribute enjoyed by another. Jealousy occurs when something we already possess, usually a special relationship, is threatened by a third person. And so envy is a two-person situation, whereas jealousy is a three-person situation. Envy is a reaction to lacking something. Jealousy is a reaction to the threat of losing something, usually someone. Envy breeds discontentment. And both envy and jealousy must be addressed because, again, another thing left unchecked that has the power to destroy. 
It is foolishness to entertain our envy because there is no love in it, only hatred and disdain. As Titus 3.3 teaches, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. As believers in Christ, we get to be free of that. But envy quickly leads to comparison, and comparison quickly leads us to envy. But sometimes it's not other people we're busy comparing ourselves to, but it's comparing our own plans to God's plans that steals that contentment. And oh, how we like to plan for the future, considering how and when our heart's desires will be brought to fruition. That can be a glorious thing as long as we are seeking God to guide us as we make these decisions. But how often do we rely on our own strength and wisdom to help us decide and discern what is good? To find contentment, we must slow down enough to make sure we have quieted our own ambition and anything solely focused on me and mine to hear what God has to say. We consider, we obey, and we hold everything with open hands. Jesus' half-brother minces no words about this and the way that we make our plans in James 4, 13-15. He says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Paul's advice in Philippians 4 is to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. But far too often we let grumbling steal our chances at contentment. This wasn't the life we wanted or the job. Or it is the life or job we wanted, but now we just feel like complaining about it. But Philippians 2, 14-15 directs us to do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. A powerful prayer life does not require hiking a mountain to be able to hear from God. God can meet us right in the middle of our busy lives to help, guide, and speak to us through prayer. I'm Christina Patterson, host of the Teach Us to Pray podcast, providing practical teaching and encouragement on how you can make prayer a natural and consistent part of your everyday life. I promise it won't require hiking a mountain, but you just might develop the faith to move one. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. What do you do when the world around you is falling apart? It's amazing to me how many people are breathing air. They're going about their business and doing the things you're supposed to do. But if you really ask them, they know that on the inside, they are spiritually and emotionally and relationally dead. If we're not careful, all of us can experience that death when what we need to do, even as the world around us is falling apart, we need to learn how to march when it would be easier to stay where we are and die. Join me each week on the March or Die show as we discuss that and so much more. It seems like an impossible ask, but God does not command us to do things he will not supply the strength for. He wants us to have contentment. He strengthens. He asks us to stop grumbling. And he strengthens. He does strengthen us for what he asks from us. We have all heard a friend say, I just need to vent. And while it is wise to seek godly friends for guidance when life's problems press in, it is not a godly behavior to just complain and grumble. The difference between pursuing godly support and sinful griping is what we do after we explain our situation. Do we ask for prayer and seek direction to deal with our stuff? Or are we just seeking to share our struggle so someone can feel bad for us and tell us that we are in the right? We need to act if something is hurting us 
and constantly driving us to feel the need to complain, then we need to figure out what kind of action we can take either to change the circumstance or to change our own heart. We have to acknowledge that contentment also requires a deep and unshakable faith. But what do we do when, not if, but when our faith feels fragile? When we are tempted to believe that faith itself is fallacious. James 1.6 says that the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But where can we find safe harbor when we poignantly identify with the wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind? When the unstableness of our own psyche is dizzied by the double-minded way we've become accustomed to talking and walking. Well, we have to question not only what we believe, but also inspect the questions opposing our beliefs. Doubt is often an indicator that we are thinking through what we have heard, evaluating it for truth, and dedicating ourselves to a right understanding. It's good and reasonable to supplement our faith with objective, logical truth, but we must keep it ultimately anchored in Christ. We don't have to fear when doubt comes. We should wrestle with it. When Jesus was approached with inquiries about salvation or the reality of who he was by people who were truly seeking, we see him answer with patience and grace. Nicodemus brought his questions to Jesus in the dead of night so that Christ's answers would bring him into the light. John the Baptist wrestled with doubt when in prison and sent his disciples to ask, Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus reassured John's friends, gave them front row seats as he fulfilled prophecy and said of John, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Thomas asked for proof of the resurrection, and Jesus displayed his scars. Jesus never cowered under the questions of those who truly were hoping for an answer. But instead, with gentleness, he rose to each inquiry with grace and truth. When doubt comes in, the answer that is often given as an antidote is trust. But if that seems improbable, at this time. Choose at least to hope. Hope that what God says is true instead of fearing that it is not. And ask God to show himself. Gosh, that's a prayer he loves to answer. If you want to be free from regret, from the past, fear, the future, and questions about the unknown, look to the Lord who provides answers without error and gives peace that is infused with grace. There, you will find the strength to be content in all circumstances. Will you pray with me? Jesus, sometimes contentment feels so far away. Our health becomes precarious, our budget's tight, and our relationships might be leaving us wanting. But you tell us that even in situations of plenty or in want, that you are there with us to strengthen us to find how to be content because we know we can trust in you. Help us to lean further in to your love and to conquer the habits that steal what you offer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So my book recommendation today is for all of you, but especially those of you who connected with That last piece of the podcast where we talked about doubt, the recommendation is A Curious Faith from Lori Ferguson Wilbert. I love this woman's writing. I have been a fan of hers for a long time. And this book dives deeply into the questions that God asks, the questions we ask, and the questions we wish someone would ask us. It is a delight and it is worth your time. Next episode will be a bit different. And that I have an announcement to make and will return to our typical format of discussing a popular saying. 
I have loved digging into these verses these past months. And as always, I am so thankful for you, the listeners, and your desire to know God's truth more. The verses, articles, and books referred to in this podcast can be found in the show notes at lifeaudio.com slash podcast or on iTunes. And if you're over in the notes, we'd love if you would rate and review this podcast so others can continue to find us. And until next time, may you seek the abundant life Jesus died to give and live in the truth that sets people free. The Bible Never Said That is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Do you want to better understand the Bible and give biblical answers to those who ask you about your faith? Hi, this is Perseus Poku, host of the Sound Reasoning Podcast Show. Listen to us weekly as we bring the truth often found in the ivory towers of seminary down to the steeple towers of local church. Join me along with many of the nation's top theologians as we offer answers to life tough questions from an apologetic perspective. Subscribe to the show at lifeaudio.com. I found myself on a ledge, three stories high, at some condominiums, contemplating my life and struggling to understand my purpose. Have you ever found yourself on the ledge? My name is Billy Yates. I'm a caring father, mentor, and friend. In my new podcast, Billy and the Goat, I share the life-changing events that shaped who I am today to remind you that no matter how far you've fallen, God can help you get up and thrive. Listen now at lifeaudio.com.